A very warm welcome to everyone joining us for special session one on climate security and green defense. My name is Lynn Kwok, and I'm the Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia-Pacific Security, and I'll be your chair for this session. The Asia-Pacific is highly exposed and vulnerable to the effects of climate change. This may in turn have substantial implications for the security of countries in the region by exacerbating tensions within or between countries and by creating new areas of contestation. The interests of the defense sector will also directly be affected. Rising sea levels, for instance, could jeopardize military facilities in coastal or island locations. At the same time, armed forces are often contributing to the climate crisis through their large-scale reliance on fossil fuels and their result in high emission levels and major carbon footprints. This session will explore how climate change is affecting security in the region, the implications for armed forces in terms of their operations and equipment procurement, and how the defense sector might play a strong role in helping to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Joining me to discuss these um, very important questions today are, to my direct left, um, Maria Ahmed Didi. She's Minister of Defense of the Maldives, the very first female minister, I understand. Congratulations thank and thank you. Um, to my right, uh, Pene Henare, Minister of Defense of, the New of New Zealand. To the end of my left there is Dr. Tobias Lidner. He's Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. And to my far right, Admiral Sir Ben Key, First Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff. Now, Minister Didi, according to multiple reports, almost 80% of the Maldives could be uninhabitable by 2050 at current rates of global warming. In plenary sessions earlier today, we heard all about the challenges that geopolitical uh, competition poses for the region, and um, that was really placed front and center. But you know, climate change has been at the top of the Maldives' uh, list of challenges for decades. Um, Maldives was, in fact, the first country to highlight the plight of small island developing states in this respect. Could you tell us how your country views uh, the threat of climate change? Thank you, Dr. Lin, esteemed colleagues, distinguished delegates, assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. At the outset, let me thank the Director General of WIWS for inviting me to the 19th edition of Asia's Premier Security Summit. Also, let me thank Defence Minister Honourable Dr. Ng for inviting me to the ministerial roundtables as well. I believe these opportunities facilitate candid discussion, build trust, and pave way for meaningful cooperation between countries. I'm glad that climate and environment security is becoming a regular feature in current strategic and security dialogues. There is undeniable evidence from conflict zones and hotspots around the world indicating that climate change is a major driver of violence and war. It can serve as an underlying motive and at times of acute environment insecurity may become a precipitant for violence and conflict. As we enter into never seen before climate projections, these conflicts are likely to become more frequent, more widespread and far bloodier. Climate security is an area where the stakes for Maldives are high. 99.7% of our country is the sea. Most islands rise barely three feet above the sea level. More than 70% of our infrastructure and 50% of our urban areas are located within 100 meters from the sea. That's just the length of a football field separating us from the ocean waves. Small island states and coastal communities have a deep and symbiotic connection to the sea. 
we are seafarers, fisher folk, and voyagers. Our fishermen reaped the bounties of the sea, and when tourism was introduced to our region, our ecological beauty became our greatest strength. The latest IPCC report projects an accelerated sea level rise hastened the dreaded 1.5 meters benchmark. Our source of livelihood and sustenance will then become our biggest vulnerability. The impact on our water, food, health, and infrastructure due to climate change induced extreme weather events is dangerously alarming. Increased droughts, floods, soil degradation, loss of land to erosion, water salination, and ocean acidification is becoming all too common. These, in turn, disrupt patterns of livelihood, undermine age-old socio-political structures, and make our communities and societies poorer, less resilient, and more porous to malicious ideologies and malign actors. Drawing from the experiences of the 2004 tsunami, where we relocated people from over 13 islands, as well as more recent extreme weather events, we have evidence to indicate that social cohesion and dynamics in the aftermath of internal migration and relocation are severely disrupted and undermined. Such societies become favorable breeding grounds for violent extremism. Narcotics, illicit smuggling, and other transnational criminal vectors become deeply entrenched. Climate change-induced extreme weather events place a huge operational and logistical burden on our defense forces in responding to emergency and HADR missions. This is a dangerous combination which is diverting time, resources, and attention away from combat readiness. In the security realm, people rarely speak of existential crisis, one with the potential to fundamentally erode all socioeconomic structures, undo the fabric of society, and tear it apart at the seams effectively erasing a nation state. For small, low-lying island states, climate change is an existential crisis. The cost of failure is unfathomable. For this highly informed audience, there is perhaps nothing new in what I have said. What may be new is our level of despair. Esteemed delegates, despite growing security worries and the challenges of keeping Maldives on track of democratic consolidation from the first day in office, President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh has established a razor-sharp focus on Maldives' climate change fight on the global stage, educating the global decision makers and advocating for our survival. So far, all the different net zero and other carbon reduction commitments from the large contributors of greenhouse gas get us to around two degrees of warming. This is still better than what we were looking at a few years back. From underwater cabinets to powerful advocacy to Maldives-led fresh initi initiatives, our environment and climate change warriors are among the leading voices on the global stage. Sadly, ground activities to show for their untiring effort is still insufficient due to lack of finance. Climate finance attribution as a percentage of Maldives GDP was about 2.4% in 2017. This figure keeps increasing. Our initial estimates suggest that it would cost Maldives more than 8 billion US dollars to address beach erosion alone. This is four times our annual budget. 
the steam delegates. We take security concerns of larger nations to our heart. We would like to believe that our partners will take our existential security concerns to their hearts as well. We require a closer alignment of climate advocacy and defense diplomacy. I believe in future, climate security will be a significant factor in the decision-making of smaller nations in exploring defense and security partnerships. Defense diplomacy needs to be coupled with tangible aid and assistance to facilitate climate mitigation and adaptation. Developed nations like the US and EU nations have developed strategies for energy transition and are developing greener technologies for the defense sector. I see this as a posit positive step. I hope these efforts become concrete realities. This afternoon, we did hear about uh, a session on military modernization and new defense capabilities, but uh, sadly, we heard very less on these also on green defense. Also, I understand that Germany, you are going to be uh, uh, spending 2% of GDP on building defense capabilities, and Japan is also going to be expanding their defense sector capabilities. I hope you think of us when you develop your uh, new defense capabilities. Think of green defense. Our military carbon footprint is obviously much smaller. However, it is critical to align our defense policies and activities with the broader national target of achieving net zero emissions by 2030. For small island nations like us, energy efficiency is a starting point. Use of renewable energy options in installations and infrastructural development should be prioritized. We have included a directive within our defense white paper for all defense sector agencies and the defense force to institute greener approaches in their mission planning and execution. The white paper also directs the defense sector agencies to set out their plans with measurable metrics to adopt more green technologies in the coming years. We have also initiated a discourse between relevant agencies and the defense force for the man management of designated marine protected zones and areas and ecological reserves within the defense estates. In spite of the odds stacked against us, we Maldivians are a resilient people. We come from the majestic, life-giving Indian Ocean, and we are trying our best to adapt to its changing currents. We need our partners to assist us in this effort. We cannot afford to sit back and watch as the future of our upcoming generation slips us into uncertainty. We cannot fail them before they even have a chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Dudi. Um, I found myself quite moved after the session with uh, President Zelensky earlier, and I find myself very moved as well um, by, your, um, by your presentation. So thank you for that. Thank you for reminding us that what, uh, while some of the facts might not be new to this audience, what is new is the level of despair um, faced by, uh, by Maldives. So thank you. Um, Minister Hanare. Um, um, <laughs> Minister Henari, um, we've heard of some of the implications or impacts of climate change on Maldives. Um, could you um, highlight or explain to us um, how the implications or effects of climate change will, what sort of implications it will have on the activities of the New Zealand Defence Forces? Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, distinguished panel, uh, colleagues, Friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. 
Uh, look, can I thank Singapore, of course, for hosting us and the IISS for allowing this dialogue to continue. It's extremely important to each and every one of us. And uh, uh, I must admit to being a little bit saddened that this room isn't packed uh, to the walls because of just how important uh, the matters of climate are to all of us. I think Minister Didi, if I may, uh, set a context, and I want to support the context that she set. So I won't uh, dive into much of what you already know with respect to climate change. For the purposes of time, I'm going to dive directly into your question uh, in the hope that I can, one, answer it, and two, inform uh, some good dialogue and debate in this exchange. While New Zealand's physical isolation and island geography have insulated us from traditional security threats in the past, these same features uh, exacerbate our susceptibility to the effects of climate change, and New Zealand is not alone in this. Many of the devastating impacts of climate change are already being felt by our southwest Pacific neighbours, including sea level rise, soil salination, and coastal inundation in severe storms. For these low-lying island states and many others, including Singapore, the climate crisis, as we already know, is an existential threat. New Zealand is both in and of the Pacific, and our security and well-being are intrinsically bound to the peace and stability of our region. The Pacific is one of my priority areas of focus as Minister of Defence and reflects the emphasis our government places on investing in the security of our region, as well as acknowledging the strong people-to-people -people ties between our nations. The New Zealand Defence Force supports the resilience of Pacific Island nations by responding in times of crisis to save lives and support rapid recovery. Aerial surveillance provides valuable information to inform relief efforts and specialist Navy capabilities can clear shipping channels and wharves to allow safe access. Military engineers and equipment combine with our air or maritime capabilities to assist with critical infrastructure repair following severe weather events. Together, these relief and repair efforts support families and communities to recover faster. We need look no further than the experience of Tonga at the beginning of this year. Despite the significant threats posed by climate change, the New Zealand government is not shying away from the challenge. In 2020, our Prime Minister declared a climate emergency, and we are taking numerous steps to rise to the challenge that climate change possesses. Our historic Zero Carbon Act sets a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050, and earlier this year we launched the government's emissions reduction plan to ensure we are on track to meet our first five-year emissions budget, securing our environment and our economy. The New Zealand government's carbon neutral government program also expects all government agencies to reduce emissions to net zero by the end of 2025, and that includes New Zealand defence organisations. In addition, we have banned new offshore oil exploration and are doubling our climate-related aid to the Pacific. These are just a few of the many steps we are taking to reduce the trajectory of future emissions, uh, though we know there is much more that we need to do to really bend the curve downwards until we hit net zero. In support of this wider New Zealand government work program on climate change, Defence has taken a proactive approach to promoting global recognition of climate change as a security risk and to developing an ongoing work program to address these challenges. New Zealand Defence has developed a four-pillar model to address climate change security challenges as outlined in our 2019 implementation plan published by the Ministry of Defence and the New Zealand Defence Force. And these four pillars are respond, adapt, mitigate and engage. The first pillar, respond, includes ensuring that New Zealand Defence Force preserves its ability to respond to more complex more frequent and potentially concurrent operations as a consequence of the impacts of climate change. This means undertaking better planning and training for operations in more extreme conditions and more directly incorporating climate change impacts into our planning for acquiring new platforms and equipment. For example, the New Zealand Defence Force is one of the few militaries globally that routinely operates in the Southern Ocean and Antarctic region. Already an environment of extremes, the impacts of climate change will make activities in the region even more complex. The second pillar, adapt, 
includes making our training areas, camps, and bases more resilient, and maintaining the ability to operate effectively in an environment changing from the effects of climate change. It will also mean adapting our capabilities and embracing new technology. To understand the region in more detail and the changes that are occurring there, the New Zealand Defence Technology Agency has studied in the Southern Ocean and Ross Sea to determine the effects of climate change and how that may change defence's operational and capability requirements. They are also looking at the sub-regional effects of changing seasonal patterns in Pacific cyclone tracks. The third pillar, mitigate, focuses on how New Zealand defence is working to reduce its own impact on the climate and achieve carbon neutrality. I acknowledge that this is a challenging goal. There is an uncomfortable tension between the role of militaries in responding to the effects of climate change and the recognition that militaries themselves often have a large carbon emissions footprint. The majority of the New Zealand Defence Force's emissions result from its operational activities, and we know it cannot simply stop flying, sailing and driving heavily armoured vehicles. However, militaries should do what they can to reduce their emissions. For example, the New Zealand Defence Force has set targets of a 15% reduction in the size of its commercial line vehicle fleet by the end of 2025-2026, uh, and for a 50% target of the fleet to be electric vehicle or hybrid by the end of 2029-2030. The New Zealand Defence Force also factors in the need to respond to and mitigate the impacts of climate change in our capability decisions, both for the overall force structure and individual capabilities. I'll use again our newest ship, the HMNZS Aotearoa, as an example. The design of the ship incorporates a new wave-piercing bow which reduces resistance and lowers fuel burn. It also has a combined diesel-electric and diesel propulsion plant which has lower fuel emissions than older vessels, as well as selective catalytic reducers which lessen harmful emissions of nitrogen oxides. It is a good example of maintaining capability uh, to respond within a changing physical environment while at the same time reducing its impact on the environment. This brings me to our final pillar, engage. Exactly as we are doing now and throughout this dialogue, we must continue to discuss climate change and security at international forum, such as this to spread awareness and to hold ourselves to account. New Zealand supports regional efforts to develop a shared understanding of the challenges and opportunities presented by climate change such as the Pacific Environmental Security Forum, which New Zealand co-hosted with US Indo-PACOM in 2019. We value these partnerships that will help design solutions to our collective operational capability, sustainability and security challenge and accelerate projects that are good for the climate. Just last month, Prime Minister Ardern signed a memorandum of cooperation with California, the world's fifth largest economy, to share information experiences and research in the urgent pursuit of emission reduction. In April, we also announced that New Zealand is teaming up with Japan to cooperate on projects which focus on renewable energies. Working with our Pacific and Indo-Pacific partners to enhance their resilience and build their capacity to lead their own climate change response is an important focus. For New Zealand, this means early engagement with our Pacific partners, uh, like I did with Fiji recently, uh, to better understand their needs and how we may be able to support them in their response planning. We also have much to learn from our Pacific partners in responding to this challenge. Aotearoa New Zealand acknowledges the leadership of our Pacific partners and, this, and, uh, and we are prepared to listen and learn from their wisdom in this area. Finally, from me, despite these initiatives, it is safe to say we are, as a collective, just starting our journey. I welcome opportunities such as this dialogue to deepen our mutual understanding of the challenges we face and strengthen our collective ability to act in response. We can only combat the global challenge of climate change together. Shared challenges require shared solutions. New Zealand looks forward to listening and learning from our partners, engaging with industry and academia, and collaborating on climate change initiatives that will help improve security for the Indo-Pacific the world, and most importantly, our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister.
Um, I'll now turn to um, Minister Littner. Um, Germany's policy guidelines for the Indo-Pacific um, highlight climate change as among the most prominent of challenges facing the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the guidelines also reference the increasing security policy implications of climate change for the region. Um, what security implications does Germany see, so, um, and how will they impact Germany's security engagement um, in Asia? Thank you so much, Excellencies, Delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank IISS for hosting this session, because some might say that we have more pressing issues to discuss than climate security and green defense. And although in these days we are faced with a brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, with rising geopolitical competition, and with challenges to the international rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific, well, I disagree. And please allow me to make the case why we cannot and should not neglect the nexus of climate and security, especially in the Indo-Pacific and especially in these days. My first point is, we no longer talk of potential or future threats to security when it comes to the climate crisis. The impacts of the climate crisis are already here, per skeptical today, in all parts of the world. Trots in East Africa, heat records in India, hurricanes in the US, floods in Germany, and in Asia, island states and coastal regions are particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels, extreme weather events, and increasing resource scarcity. Global food security already under stress is further being challenged by the Russian destruction of farming and transport infrastructure in Ukraine. Countries are struggling to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and suffering from flooding or droughts. Now they face further challenges to food and nutrition security, energy, commodity prices, and public finances. What we can see today following Russia's blockade of Ukrainian wheat exports is, in a way, a fast forward snapshot of what experts have been predicting as a result of climate change induced resource scarcity. Rising commodity prices, higher potential for political instability, and increasing competition for resources. Or, to put it more bluntly, a drastically increased potential for conflict. And this brings me to my second point. In recent years, we focused more and more on security risks induced by climate change. At the same time, we should also take a closer look at the impact of conflict on climate change itself and the environment. And from this angle, the actual threat is truly a vicious circle that becomes visible. The brutal Russian aggression against Ukraine is not only a blatant violation of international law, of the very principles of the UN Charter, it is not only a human and humanitarian catastrophe with killing of civilians, the shelling of cities and villages, the horrendous images and reports about torture and rape, it is also a massive attack on the environment. Whether it is the bombing of oil refineries or chemical facilities, Russia's scorched earth policy, the near misses of a nuclear plant on Saporizhia, or more recently, a just avoided massive, massive spill of toxic, toxic waste into the Azov Sea. Ladies and gentlemen, the Russian war is threatening to cause environmental damage to the tune of billions of euros. And this, ladies and gentlemen, this is the wish circle I mentioned at the outset. Climate change increases the risk of conflict. Conflict, in return, has an extremely high carbon and climate cost, ultimately affecting all of us, our livelihoods and our security. So my third point is, what can we do and what should we do about this? With respect to the immediate situation, it is, of course, imperative that we join hands to put pressure on President Putin to end this war of choice and to pull back his troops. On a more systemic level, I see three fields of action. First, most importantly, we need to define answers together. Protectionist measures 
such as export restrictions, will not solve the problems we are facing today or that we will be facing tomorrow. Our aim must be to keep global trade in food commodities free of unjustified trade barriers, enhance solidarity towards the most vulnerable countries, and increase local sustainable food production to reduce structural dependencies. What we need to understand, since we all share this planet's climate and ecosystems, cooperation is key because the consequences of climate change and the risks to security and stability do not stop at our borders. We are well aware that countries in the Indo-Pacific, especially Pacific Island countries, but also island states and coastal regions in South and Southeast Asia are particularly vulnerable, sometimes existentially affected as we hear it. Germany and the European Union are therefore intensifying political cooperation with countries in the region, for instance, with the group of the Pacific Small Island Developing States in order to help mitigate the effects of climate change and increase regional resilience. Together with Nauru, Germany has founded the Group of Friends on Climate and Security. And the Group of Friends is still growing, and we just welcomed Japan as a new member. Second, support and cooperation must not create political or economic dependencies. No country shall take advantage of the existential threat climate change poses to the ones most affected. And cooperation against climate change should come not with a political price tag, ladies and gentlemen. As Europeans, we stand for an open, transparent and inclusive approach in the Indo-Pacific, which is not against anyone, but which is based on rules and multilateral cooperation. This is also why we decided at the G7 foreign ministers meeting in May that we will establish a climate, environment, peace and security initiative which will work with all those committed to tackling climate and environmental risks for peace and stability across the world. Last but not least, we need to accelerate our transition to fossil-free energy and decarbonized economies. Rapid deployment of renewable energy will not only keep, help us keep the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, in reach and hence also help mitigate risks to security and stability. It also means that we get rid of the major security risk that is posed by one-sided dependencies on fossil fuels. In Germany, we have learned hard lessons. We have painfully experienced the downsides of our dependency on Russian oil and gas but we are now making every effort to end these dependencies as quickly as possible. Energy transition has become a cornerstone of our security policy. And as we are supporting just energy, energy transition across the world, but also through partnerships with countries in the Indo-Pacific, we are looking both at the benefits of net zero emissions for climate change, as well as for the international security. Ladies and gentlemen, Green defense, fighting the climate crisis, a good sustainable energy policy, this is nothing for the better days. That's not an easy problem when there is no war on this planet. It's in the interest that we fight it as quick and as good and, and as sustainable as possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Littner. Um, I turn now to you, Admiral Key. Um, of European countries, the UK has arguably made one of the most thorough examinations of how defence can make the energy transition and contribute to national net zero goals. The UK's Ministry of Defence has set itself a hard target of achieving net zero by 2050. Given uh, the geopolitical challenges that we face, um, including the war in Ukraine, um, some might argue that perhaps these ambitious goals might not be wise, given that there might be a trade-off between efficiency and, um, and the goal of reducing um, emissions targets. Or in the words of my colleague Ben Berry, who I see in the audience, um, is there a risk of the UK disarming as it decarbonizes? Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Koch, and um, 
I just echo the words of my fellow panelists in thanking uh, Singapore for once again hosting Shangri-La Dialogue in person and for IISS for facilitating it and uh, for the opportunity to speak at this panel. So your question implies that we have an either or choice and I don't believe we do. The joy for me of coming after three such distinguished fellow panelists is that they have made the case and luckily for you I'm not going to try and repeat that. But we have an existential threat to all of mankind that far outweighs in gravity, in, in gravity any threat that man may be doing to fellow man uh, around the world as we see in a number of the conflicts and crises that we currently uh, are wrestling with. And so we have to address both at the same time. And, and I think the reason for that plays out in four particular ways. We've touched on the moral case already uh, we have an obligation to the planet, uh, this beautiful planet that we all have the joy of sharing with each other and the natural world, that we look after it and that we look after it considerably better than perhaps we have done in recent decades. And Minister Didi's um, compelling argument uh, probably makes it better than anyone else could. So the moral case is clear, but there's also um, a reputational case because I think our young people demand it of us. In my recent CPAR conference, which IISS uh, kindly hosted in London a few weeks ago, I was challenged by one of the young sailors uh, serving in the Royal Navy today, that actually if we don't take it seriously, then those who join us to serve will see that our values as an organization, whether that's as a Navy, an Air Force, an Army, or as defense more broadly, do not align with their own, and they won't stay. And so if we wish to function effectively as the defense forces and militaries of the future, then we need to reflect the values which are so strongly held by so many of the young people uh, that we have the privilege of employing. They are our very own, to quote Minister Didi, our very own climate change warriors, we may dress them in uniform, but their commitment to the environment is as great as their commitment to peace and security. And then there's the business case. We have to change because all around us, the commercial and technological advances are also driving change. It just does not make economic sense to continue to burn fossil fuels if the rest of the world has used to, moved to a bioenergy setup. It's a bit like trying to drive a Land Rover that's 50 years old when everybody else is in electric cars. And we have to reflect that, particularly for those of us who, and I can say this as a sailor, tend to build military platforms that endure for many decades. I'm delighted that HMS Spey and HMS Tamar that are deploy deployed across the Asia Pacific region today are the greenest ships built by the Royal Navy. But I'm saddened to say that they are not zero carbon. And we still have a huge amount of work to ensure that whatever we build in the future can be adapted to embrace technology and changing climate adaptations. We in the militaries have to play our part investing in it. We need to make our contributions into R&D alongside industry. But let's be honest, we're not going to drive the pace of change that the rest of the world will. And so we have to be early adopters of what else is happening and configure ourselves to embrace the opportunities as they're laid out. And the final case is the operational one. Because actually, if we can rid ourselves of dependency on fossil fuels, if we can find ways of ensuring that we are not leaving um, human uh, rubbish uh, uh, around the world as we conduct our operations, if we found ways of recycling and reprocessing all of this, then actually we create freedoms for ourselves in an operational case. We do not need to tie ourselves to particular ways of doing business. And not only therefore do we adapt to how the world is opening up as climate change affects us, uh, and I would look, for instance, at the retreating ice along the northern sea routes north of both the American and Russian coastlines inside the Arctic Circle, as one example. But we are also, therefore, going to be able to adapt our tactics, techniques and procedures for best having military effect in support of a greater peace and prosperity. 
So to answer your question, against that context, we have to achieve what's been laid before us. Not only is it a legal mandate placed upon the United Kingdom by signing up to the 2019 Paris Accord and now captured in our domestic law, but actually if we don't, we will fail not just ourselves and those who come after us, as Minister Hanari put across, but actually we will be unable to fulfill the role that is expected of us as military organisations. Given what you said then, and returning to a question that Minister Didi posed um, to Minister um, Littner, when Germany seeks to boost its defence capabilities and Japan seeks to do so, do similarly, um, there should be no concerns about trade-offs and all green um, uh, defence technology. Thank you, and, and to be, be precise about that, no, there is no reason to, for concern. Uh, in fact, we will also increase our efforts in climate diplomacy and, and really trying to, to reduce carbon worldwide. Um, just yesterday, the, the Second Chamber of Parliament decided on that 100 billion special fund for the armed forces, uh, by which we will achieve 2% of our GDP for, for defense over the next years. And that fund is made in a way, in an in a, in a amendment of our constitution, that it provides additional money. Maybe some of you know that the German constitution requires the government to a balanced budget in normal times. So without an amendment of the constitution, exactly it would have happened, what, what could, could happen, that there would be a trade-off. But we, we solved it in a way to have an additional special fund so that our efforts uh, for, for supporting the protection of the climate worldwide, that they, those efforts are not targeted. And to be, to be more precise, I had one last point, which was also, also made by the Admiral. It's not a race to the arms. We simply have to invest into our armed forces because we have to modernize our systems. And to replace, for instance, um, old, old trucks and old vehicles in the armed forces, in, by, by modernizing the infrastructure, the housing, that also leads to a smaller carbon footprint of our armed forces. Thanks so much. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, if you could just raise your hand, and I already see uh, one over there, please. Hi, I have two related questions. One is on procurement. Um, it's very difficult to deal with procurement when you're not sure which technologies will be the ones employed. So I would really like to know how you balance that and we're making decisions that will go for decades, and particularly around fuel, for example. So I'd love to know how you, how you try and balance that. And my other question is on military transparency. That's an oxymoron, obviously, um, but we do need more transparency to hit climate goals. So again, I'd like to know how you, how you balance those needs. Thank you. Gentleman over there. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and congratulations to the IISS for, for another panel on, on climate. I think it's terrific and, and very welcome. Uh, my question is to Minister Henare, and I just wanted to ask you about a question about what this means for capabilities. Uh, you mentioned the need to uh, adapt the defence estate to make bases and facilities more resilient in the face of rising seas and so on. But thinking beyond that, you also mentioned uh, the need to be able to respond to more complex challenges in the South Pacific HADR scenarios and also in the Southern Ocean, potentially concurrently. Um, what's your thinking about the kinds of capabilities that NZDF needs to be able to meet those challenges? Um, I think I saw a hand over there first. Yes, the gentleman there. <clears throat> I would like to know the panel's views on the only resolution that has been moved in the United Nations so Security... So sorry to interrupt you there, but um, I, could I please request that everyone um, uh, introduce themselves as well as your affiliation? Thank you. Right. My name is K.P. Nair. I'm from uh, India. Uh, I would like to know the panel's views on the only resolution that has been introduced in the United Nations Security Council on climate and security recently. Ireland and Niger tabled the resolution, but it was uh, vetoed by Russia. 
And uh, the pattern of voting was that uh, India and China also were against this resolution, uh, while 12 other members of the Security Council supported the resolution. Since 2007, efforts have been underway to uh, get the Security Council to do something on climate and security. And there have been many piecemeal resolutions which refer to climate and security. But this was the only comprehensive resolution on, on this subject uh, to date. So what does the panel think? Uh, what will be the way ahead? Because the uh, pattern of voting in the Security Council has been similar to the pattern on resolutions on uh, Ukraine and Russia with uh, India, China, and uh, Russia taking, taking that position. And specifically to Minister Didi, uh, since uh, her compatriot Maldivian is uh, the president of the General Assembly, the current president of the United Nations General Assembly, what can Maldives and the president of the General Assembly do to advance this cause. 113 members of the General Assembly are in favor of this, not quite two thirds really, but uh, 113 is a big number. So how can the Maldivian presidency advance the cause of climate and security? Thank you. And I think the last session for this round, um, my colleague Ben Shreer from the IISS uh, Europe Office, Executive Director of the IISS Europe Office. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, my question goes to Minister of State uh, Lindner. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Since you're also an expert in defense policy, I thought I'd pick you up brain on how the Bundeswehr should be uh, uh, you know, adjusted to, to, to green defense. Um, first, um, should it bec become a goal and objective of Germany's first national security strategy? You, you know, should it be effectively stated in that document that green defense is, is, is an aspiration uh, for the Bundeswehr? Um, and secondly, how do we then build a more effective cooperation between the armed forces, industry, and societal actors to really green um, the Bundeswehr, which is a national effort at the end of the day, if we take it then seriously? Thank you. So um, shall we go this way? way and um, <laughs> and uh, please just uh, pick the questions you'd like to respond to or that were addressed to you. I don't think there were any specifically addressed to you. Uh, thanks very much. Obviously a number of those uh, I'm going to leave to my political colleagues. Um, luckily they're matters of policy. Um, military transparency is a paradoxical statement. Uh, and there is, there is something in what you say, and we as uh, defense organizations have to get better at understanding that information which we must protect because it gives us operational advantage, and that information which we must share because it shows we're responsible members of the planet. And I think this is a very live uh, and real question for us, and one that involves not just us, but also our industrial partners, because some of that technology, and I think this reflects uh, a little bit Ben Schreer's point to uh, Minister Linden uh, about the German approach. Some of uh, what we're going to do now is not the preserve of just those of us who serve in uniform or those who work in, in, the, in the industrial capacity, but actually a mindset across, across the entire defence sector that the obligation placed upon us is so great we have to, we have to front up and admit how we're doing. Some of that will be solved by the very fact that we will be seen to be adopting new technologies, otherwise we'll be trying to fuel a diesel Land Rover when the world is only full of electric charging points. Some of that will be because industries like the aviation industry are already making huge advances in the use of biofuels and, and, and how we can therefore uh, contribute. But I know that uh, Secretary of Defence Wallace, if he was here, would be also very clear that he is holding me and my fellow service chiefs to account for the progress that we are making against plans to demonstrate reduction in carbon emissions. We are not going to solve these overnight. Some of our, some of our equipment are, um, has been in service for some time and will need adaption. But um, certainly within the Royal Navy, and I know that my fellow Chief of the General Staff and, and Chief of the Air Staff colleagues, we have just published and they have also some very extensive um, first steps in in environmental strategies. I think it's fair to say we need to learn quite a lot now, having made this breakthrough commitment, 
um, before we can articulate how quickly we can adjust. Uh, there will be a cost to it, and uh, uh, it will not have escaped everybody that defence does not have access to limitless funds. Um, but I think you should uh, expect year by year to ask us how we're doing and anticipate that we will enthusiastically respond. Did you also want to address the question on procurement? Well, I touched on upon it just now that actually we've got to change the nature. And I noticed there are certain members of various, you know, key industrial capacities here. Uh, and actually, we just have to commit ourselves because climate change affects them as much as it does us. And it will affect the environment in which the um, uh, defence sector operates as much as it does us. And therefore, there comes a point at which this becomes a defence activity, not something that is between the military and a number of competitive organisations trying to sell us things. Minister Hannery. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, and um, <clears throat> if I can start by saying that uh, originally the New Zealand government looked towards a defence capability plan that was uh, in 2019. Uh, and uh, of course, lots has happened since then. COVID, uh, all the matters that we've discussed around supply chains, uh, high inflation, cost of living, matters that governments have to balance. Therefore, we've undertaken a process that will look towards our reprioritization and making sure that the decisions we make with respect to our capabilities will be strategic, will continue to align with our government's priorities as we move forward and look beyond uh, our electoral cycles and into a longer planning time. Uh, but also acknowledging too that in order for us to have the capabilities that will match the complex needs I described and you asked in your questions, it's important that these collaboration opportunities allow us to do that. And I acknowledge uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Minister Seruiratu from Fiji, uh, who we have a close relationship uh, with and we continue to look towards uh, for their advice and their input uh, that will contribute to the decisions we make with respect to our capabilities and our procurement moving forward. Um, I've mentioned uh, already uh, our ship uh, that we use, Aotearoa, which recently uh, voyaged to Antarctica uh, to serve our interests there. Uh, the other part, though, is of course very soon New Zealand will be upgrading to the P8 uh, to allow us to have a far greater view uh, and uh, across our domain, uh, and also uh, our upgrade of uh, the new Hercules uh, allows us to continue to support and respond to matters in the Pacific. Those are the kinds of attention that uh, are required over the, uh, dare I say, short to midterm. Uh, but if I were to gaze into the future, sir, and, and think about your question, uh, what might be the kind of uh, uh, capabilities that we'd look forward uh, to serving uh, our country in these complex times? Uh, I think of the opportunities in technology, self-autonomous drones, etc., uh, that can do large surveillance and reconnaissance work uh, remotely, uh, which obviously clearly don't require uh, the large uh, fuel, uh, though they leave a smaller carbon footprint. Uh, and I think those are opportunities that the likes of New Zealand uh, would be welcoming uh, as we explore those uh, kinds of technologies that will help us respond to these complex uh, scenarios, but also be the responsible citizen uh, that we plan to be, as I described in my opening comments. Thank you. And Minister Didi, I think there was a question specifically addressed to you about what, um, what Maldives can do to advance the cause of climate change. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Nair, for asking that. Uh, question, um, yes, we managed to get two-third UN, uh, 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 UN positive yeses to be able to put our foreign minister as the president of the UN General Assembly. We are working very hard. Maldives was part of the core group who advocated for safe environment as a human right. The resolution was part passed at the Human Rights uh, com uh, co Commission in Geneva. And Maldives 
we are currently working towards a similar resolution in New York. We shall continue to appeal, we shall try to persuade, uh, we shall not stop our endeavors to get climate on the agenda wherever you know, there is a debate about the future of our planet. Thank you. Thank you, and Minister Lindner, um, the two questions from Ben Trier. So, thank you. Uh, let me make one comment on the issue of the resolution in the Security Council. And, and as you said, unfortunately, we see the pattern that it was blocked like other resolutions. And my answer would be, first of all, don't never give up. We should try to get a resolution within the urine system passed. My second answer would be, that's no excuse. And that's the reason why I mentioned the G7 initiative Germany led at the foreign minister's meeting. We are all as, as countries responsible in our alliances, in our communities to do what we can. So on, 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 on the questions concerning Germany and procurement and, and our armed forces, uh, let me start with the transparency question. I believe, especially within in NATO and the European Union, we should more emphasize the carbon footprint of our armed forces. And we, we should have indicators that are comparable. We should have lessons learned. We should have best practices. That's the first aspect. The second aspect is, I mentioned in, in my opening statement that Russian rockets almost hit nuclear power plants in Ukraine. And let me be very outspoken from the point of view of my government, targeting a nuclear power plant is a war crime. So I can only hope that this was a mistake by the Russian forces and not something uh, that was planned. Because our understanding of international law is targeting such facilities, accepting such risks in a war is a war crime. Full stop on that. Now on, on technologies and, and the responsibility of our own armed forces. As many of you know, our government is drafting for the first time under responsibility of the Foreign Office a national security strategy. We will finalize it by the end of this year. That strategy will have a holistic, a coherent approach that does include for sure economics, cyber, health, resilient supply chains, but for sure the environment and also fighting the climate crisis. And as the Admiral said, our countries have signed the Paris Agreement uh, on reducing our carbon footprint. And so there's a special responsibility with our own armed forces. Uh, the German armed forces have the highest demand on, on energy as an organization in our country. So they have a responsibility. Let me please, please be outspoken. And don't understand me wrong, there is no such thing as green or sustainable warfare. War itself is bad and it is, it is a catastrophe. But it is a responsibility of armed forces when it comes to housing, infrastructure, and especially to procurement, how to, to reduce a carbon footprint. I think there are three implications. First implication, we have to, be, we have to think in shorter terms when it comes to procurement. For sure, you procure ships for decades, but technologies are evolving so quickly that the idea of the past, you construct a battle tank, you use it for four decades, then you start thinking about replacing it, that does not fit to our times, to be, to be honest on that. Second, the climate change induces the capabilities we need. I will give you one example. Uh, our parliament has decided to procure new submarines together with Norway. These submarines will be larger than the ones we have because we do not only need them for the Baltic Sea as they were planned in the past. We also need them uh, for the Atlantic and for the North Sea since the, since the ice shield is melting and since threats may come from, from other routes. And third and foremost, I strongly believe, for sure, coming back to the battle tank or to the fighter chat, the purpose of a battle tank is fighting. But if you can compare two models and one has a lower carbon footprint, I think the decision should be obvious. 
and it should play a role in our procurement processes. And as the Admiral said, I believe also from an operational and tactical standpoint, it's an advantage to have tanks, to have jets, to have ships that need less fossil fuels. That's better for the environment, it's better for the climate, and it's also better from, from the standpoint um, um, of the operational view. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now collect the next round of questions. Um, uh, I think I saw the gentleman over there, Reinhardt, uh, the first question, and then after that, you, and then you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I hear a lot of harmony between the participants of the panel, and uh, I think uh, that is very good because we all need to uh, master a very steep learning curve. And I do not want to ask a question. I want to make a short contribution pointing out that in the European Parliament, and by the way, I forgot uh, saying who I am. I'm a member of the European Parliament. In the European Parliament just this week, a report has been adopted on the 6th of June uh, dealing with a uh, external action service roadmap on EU defense and climate policy. And that report deals with issues like uh, the, reducing the carbon footprint of the military, for instance, military energy infrastructure, um, looking after early warning systems related to climate security risks, or um, including in our defense policies, policies on energy sovereignty and climate policy. And I just wanted to share this experience because maybe we can learn also from each other in how we do better. Thank you. Thank you. Please, sir. Just wait for the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. I come from the Chinese PRC. With regards to this topic today, with regards to green, uh, green defense and climate security, Perhaps I will repeat what I said earlier. I came from the PLA, um, a researcher from the PLA Security, uh, Tao Yanzhong, that's my name. With regards to this topic on climate security and green defense, I think that is a very interesting topic. I heard the various participants share your topics, and I think that some many of you have spoken very well because we share this planet and we must protect this environment especially with regards to the sec uh, climate security, we military must also play our role in this. As you all know, China is also a, a signatory, a very avid signatory in the Paris Agreement. It is also our fervent hope and also the fervent hope of uh, Xi Jinping to have a common humanity as well as a beautiful earth. I think that with regards to green defense and climate security, if these two can be linked together, then this will be a very interesting topic for us to explore further. Therefore, my question is towards the German participant, the German speaker, as to how we should look at what are the fundamentals in the building, the fundamental measures in the building of a green defense? Is it through the building of a very, um, uh, to, to try to re resist having arms competition, to have a peaceful environment? Wouldn't that be the best way to go forth? Especially the US, its military expenditure is about 40% of its GDP. In other words, the it is the 
total combination of the last 40 countries in the, the bottom 10 countries in terms of arms expedition expenditure. So if we can reduce arms expenditure in the first place, wouldn't this already help to protect and be a more meaningful measure to build up green defense? So I would like to ask our German speaker how he views uh, what a big country, a, a great nation should play, the role that it should play, play in green defense, and how countries should cooperate together. And um, Pia Renato, who's one of our young leaders. Hello, yes, I'm Pia from the Philippines. And um, my question is for Minister Didi, but I would also appreciate any insights from the rest of the panel. Uh, this is about climate refugees. and. Um, as we, we know that climate impacts will pose a, a real reality of um, large-scale migration, especially when certain populations feel impacts of climate change. So we also know that refugee, the refugee crisis all over the world is highly political. We've seen this with the Rohingya refugees, African refugees in Europe, a uh, very political issue. So I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of engagement would you want to see the defense sector how would you want to see the defense sector engage in crafting a framework for climate refugees? Uh, how, we know that governments are dealing with this already in climate conferences, but so far there has been, uh, it's been very vague, the proposals for this, and how do you think the defense sector can contribute in making this more concrete? My colleague, Ben Berry, um, please. Um, I haven't any questions, but I have some observations that I think people would find useful. I, I should explain myself. I've been running ISS's work on green defence for the last two years, and we've been um, greatly assisted by the UK Ministry of Defence and the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for which we're very grateful. Uh, earlier this year, we produced a report on green defence, which is buried away in the publications section of the app. But if anyone would like a copy, if they give me their card afterwards, I'll make sure it's sent to you as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, and that, that work has l led me to thoroughly endorse almost all the points that have been made by, by the speakers. Um, a point on transparency, there will need to be internal transparency within organisations. There will be challenges of change, particularly amongst uh, military personnel. For example, if an army decides to move away from, from tanks, to smaller, lighter wheeled, ve wheeled vehicles. And there are potential winners and losers in military organizations. So the military organizations auditing their climate emissions, but being transparent internally, so that the hard decisions that are taken are seen to be justified, I think is very important. Um, I, I disagree slightly with Minister Linda about shorter life cycles of military equipment. Um, let's take Boxer. Most modern armoured vehicles serve for at least 40 years at the moment. Um, Boxer has a very advanced diesel, um, but there is time in the 26 years between now and 2050 for midlife updates of Boxers to incorporate new technologies such as hybrid electric, dri electric drives. And navies, of course, are continually improving and monitoring their ships as well as bringing them in for serious midlife, mid-life updates. Um, I think the other, the, I, I'd sound a slightly cautionary note. Um, our, we've, we, in the Institute, we've got some climate experts and they both believe that there are, for, there are probable circumstances in which various climate change factors interact in an unpredictable way and we get tipping points with feedback loops. I mean, one I think that's reasonably well understood is the potential of rapid release of methane, setting up a positive feedback loops and making things worse much more quickly. And the weather is sufficiently unpredictable and becoming more unpredictable that extreme climate events are more likely, including in parts of Europe that have been relatively benign. Um, and there is a possibility that in democratic countries, this will lead to um, more calls for climate adaptation. And the chief of the Royal Air Force has been very frank in public that he thinks that's more likely to happen than not. And that's one reason why he set the Royal Air Force as demanding stretch target of reaching net zero by 2040. 
there's, there's a risk that comes from this, that an increasing number of climate extreme events could lead to climate activism becoming violent, locally, regionally, or even um, interna internationally. And I, I think it would be um, prudent to take that in, into account in strategic planning. I hope that helps. Thanks, Lynn. Um, and James Hackett, please. Thanks, Lynn. Um, for everyone, I'm the editor of the Military Balance at the IISS. I was struck um, during the presentations by Mr. Lindner, um, Minister Hinari, and uh, the First Sea Lord of the development of climate uh, adapted and suitable military equipment, uh, green capability development, if you will. But that's not a luxury for everyone that everyone can afford. Um, small armed forces that rely on older kit and capability donations, for example, might not have the same benefits from climate adapted or greener military equipment. So my question to Minister Didi actually is how do you think that larger nations, more established armed forces should help smaller nations um, in developing their armed forces, coast guards, if you will, as well, uh, to uh, introduce and develop and integrate equipment that's uh, climate adapted from the beginning so that we're, your armed forces for smaller nations uh, don't have to integrate that older equipment that's uh, less environmentally friendly. John Rain, please. I wanted to uh, invite the views of the panel on the reputational hazard which attaches to green defence. By comparison with the commercial and industrial sector, where the ESG debate has now clearly exposed the hazard of promising more than you deliver and being seen to be subject to external imperatives. Whether they're temptations in the market or market opportunities, there are clear overrides to green manifestos. So, I, in a way, I, I'm looking for a statement of the business case of the imperatives for green defence <coughs> rather than the options, because the options have been shown, again, by parallel with, in the commercial sector, to be options that can be unmade as well as made. So, so what are the imperatives? What's the hard business case for green defence? Thank you. Shall we go in the reverse order now? You go first, Mr. Linda. Thank you. I'm trying to do it as quick as I can. One, one comment on the box. I, I think we can agree that at least for such systems, and you mentioned lifetime upgrades, you should be flexible. My, my, my point was with, with regard to capabilities and capability planning, we should resist the temptation that when we procure a system that works today for decades, we know how warfare in 20 or 30 or 40 year it's looking like that's the big challenge i think we are facing especially in these times um one comment on the business case the business case is that there's also an operational advantage for the forces if you have systems for instance that that need less fossil fuels that that would be my that would be my answer and that in in our societies maybe you have a better acceptance also of military procurement if you have systems with a lower carbon footprint and let me make a more more detailed comment on on, on the question that a Chinese delegate uh, posed to me. So first of all, I'm economist by training. I'm a little bit skeptical in the comparison of numbers of defense expenditures, since in some countries the defense industry is a free market economy. In other countries, you have state-owned. Um, defense industry, it's hard to, to compare the purchasing power and the numbers when they come at heart. But let me answer more general. The best way to avoid a race to the arms is the respect of the international rules-based order and the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries. And we witnessed in February that Putin questioned the statehood not only of Ukraine. In these days, he questioned the statehood of Sweden. And unfortunately, we must learn 
that he is doing what he's saying. And I think it's the sovereign right of the European countries to work on a credible deterrence to stop and at least to contain him and that he might not go further than Ukraine. But beyond this, at the same time, we should look for something I would call complementary arms control. The time of arms control is not over, for instance, when we are, when we are looking at hypersonic weapons. And let me make one, one concrete example where we need the People's Republic of China as a partner. We in Germany have experienced a few years ago under the Trump administration that the INF Treaty now belongs to history. A treaty that forbids mid-sized missiles on European soil. A treaty that was settled between the Soviet Union and the United States of America about security in Europe. I personally would very welcome if we could go back to such a treaty. But if we are honest, Soviet Union does exist no more. And today it's not anymore about the United States and the Russian Federation. We need China as a partner and we need to involve the Europeans. And I, I'm convinced if we would succeed, that would make this planet more safe. So let's do not forget about such initiatives and such ideas. Thank you. I'll turn to Admiral Key next. Um, thank you. I'll just pick up on, on, on two themes, I think, that I refer. The first is on the adaptability of kit, um, which is, by its very nature, we should look to last as long as possible, but make as adaptable as possible to embrace emerging, emerging technologies. So I would look at the ships that we're building for the Royal Navy today must have open architecture systems, and I'm not talking about that necessarily in an IT sense, but in a, uh, a machinery sense, such that when when advancements are made that allow us to reduce our carbon footprint, we can make those changes readily. And that is quite an obligation upon us uh, and may involve shorter term costs than we would wish, but has a longer term benefit that we are obliged to, to live with. And I look at, um, there has been mention made a number of times in the last couple of days about HMS Queen Elizabeth. That is a ship we anticipate will be around for at least 50 years. She will be fueled very differently in 50 years' time and operate a very different form of aircraft in 50 years' time. I have no idea what they will be. All I know is that we have to embrace that when they, when they come through. The other broader point, and I think just picking up on what uh, my Chinese military colleagues referred to in terms of green defence, one of the things I think we in military organisations need to understand is, is our impact on the environment, not just in times of conflict, uh, when we can be utterly destructive, uh, but also in times of peace, when, when often we can be accused with understandable evidence of paying less attention to the environment than we should. Now, in the UK, um, uh, a number of the MOD land sites actually also contain sites of special scientific interest because as training ranges they tend not to be walked on by the public uh, and therefore actually some, uh, some uh, wonderful elements of the natural world uh, can prevail. Uh, but of course we then need to make sure that we protect and understand them and limit our, limit our training activities. We need to make sure that we don't build needless number of bases but embrace that which is available. Um, you know, the tendency for military engineers to pour concrete wherever they can uh, is a factor of uh, modern warfare. Um, and, and I'm not sure that's a valid approach anymore. We need to fight with and alongside the environment, not try and bend the environment to suit ourselves. Minister Hanoi? Uh, not speaking directly necessarily to a question but probably a broader view of a number of the themes across some of those questions. I think about the uh, Tongan volcanic eruption, the Tongan volcanic eruption at the beginning of this year. There are no shortage of ships that, and countries that wanted to get involved but lacked the coordination. That taught us a number of things. One, of course we have to get better coordinated, that's a no-brainer. Uh, perhaps the most efficient or effective technology is a phone call. Sounds rather simple, but uh, actually goes a long way. The second one is that as we look towards supporting 
uh, Pacific nations in particular, and this is probably more to the question uh, from Mr. Hackett here about uh, the way we support them to develop their own uh, capabilities uh, so that they can be a value add to our network of response across vast areas. And one of New Zealand's key roles here is, of course, and I mentioned my colleague, Minister Seruiratu, is a very clear statement of intent between us towards looking at how we support them and they support us uh, across our response frameworks and our response timeframes uh, across such a vast area like the Pacific Ocean and even further south into the Southern Ocean. Uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes it does mean that actually you, one has to put their money where their mouth is and simply hand me downs or handing down your current capability. Um, we must make a clear decision on whether or not that's the right thing to do. And actually what might be better and far more effective and uh, green, if you will, uh, will be to put our money where our mouth is. And we can only do that if we do that collaboratively when I think across uh, an area like the Pacific. And the last word goes to you, Minister Didi. Thank you, Dr. Um, your question, Ms. Ranada, on uh, climate refugees. As I mentioned while I was speaking, um, tsunami, although not climate rela related, so 13 islands, islanders having to be re relocated. The island of Hatifushi, which suffered from extreme uh, weather conditions that they couldn't stay on the island, had to be relocated. So these sort of uh, things which we face every day. Uh, for instance, uh, when the tourist in Maldives is on the beach looking at the full moon, our forces are on the ground going somewhere because uh, the high tide has come into the island and it's become flooded. And we have a very low... Uh, uh, water table, so water from underneath also because of the high tide rises. And in addition, if it rains then, the water from above is going into the houses as well. So these sort of uh, climate thing uh, related uh, disasters are becoming more and more common. Every month we are facing it, every year we are facing it, and many island communities relocate. And as I uh, told you, these undermine the age-old social, political structures. Uh, it makes the communities poorer as well, and when they have to go to the other islands and live, they're less resilient and more porous to uh, malicious ideals, malign actors, you know, like, uh, 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 like uh, violent extremism or extremist ideologies, you know, where pre preachers, when, when they have nothing, it's easy for them to uh, be indoctrinated with extremist ideology. So you can imagine it at a larger scale. We are facing it smaller scales because we are a thousand islands, but 189 inhabited islands. Most, as I told you, you know, the highest point, barely three feet. So if there is flooding and all that, it really affects us. And it is something real that we suffer every day and our forces are stretched uh, Mr. Hackett, your question, uh, in fact, your observation is very valid. We have the same problems, you know, IUU fishing, narco trading in the region, search and rescue missions, which we have to uh, address, you know, if a life is lost at sea or there's rough weather, our people have to go out, you know, they do the searches and all that, and we need Coast Guard equipment. Yes, we rely on older equipments. To some extent, the hand-me-downs. And so, in fact, we <laughs> are polluting ourselves. And we, as I told you in the beginning, for social, uh, so for soil erosion, shore, shore degradation, and to protect our shores as well, it will take about 
eight billion U.S. dollars, which is about four times our annual budget. But we are trying hard. We are appealing to the international community. We are appealing to those concerned about uh, uh, climate change that it is real. It is not something on the textbooks. You have to just go to the Maldives to feel it, to believe it. Many islands, you know, smaller islands have disappeared. Some have come up as well. But it is real, and this is one thing that doesn't go away. We really have to address it, and I'm glad that the IISS chose this as a forum to speak about climate change and what the future of our planet. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we are now approaching the end of our session. I'd just like to commend two publications to you. One of them is the, the report um, written by my colleague Ben Berry um, on green defense, the defense and military implications of climate change for Europe. Um, as he mentioned, it's available on your IISS events app uh, for downloading. Um, the other uh, publication is um, um, a chapter in the recently launched Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment on the climate crisis and Asia-Pacific security. Um, when I came to this subject, I certainly came to it with a great deal of humility, hoping to learn something in this session, and learn I have. So thank you so much for that. Please, all of you, join me in uh, thanking the wonderful panelists on today's session speaking about the very important, clear and present danger of climate change. Thank you. <laughs>